Hello, my name is Catherine R. Power. I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of Political Science at the University of Toronto, and I also teach political theory at the Glendon campus of York University, also here in Toronto. I'm very pleased to uh, present my paper for RSA 2021 entitled Between Anarchy and Absolutism, Etienne de la Boissy and Jean Baudin in Dialogue. So this presentation is drawn from my larger dissertation work, placing Jean Baudin in virtual dialogue with Etienne de la Boissy. Though Le Boissy was born into somewhat higher privilege as the son of royal officials and parlementaires than Baudin, whose father was merely a successful tradesman, the two men were born in the same year and both went on to earn law degrees and demonstrate their neoclassical humanist education and training in their writings. Though Le Boissy died quite young, some of his writings and his memory were immortalized by his more famous friend, Michel de Montaigne, and his fiery discourse on voluntary servitude, also dubbed the contre un had a surprisingly long afterlife in the centuries following his death, and despite Montaigne leaving it out of the collection of his friend's posthumous writings that he did publish. Le Boissy's fiery language and sweeping condemnation of subjection in the name of innate natural freedom made him popular with radical or revolutionary audiences from the Monarchomax to French revolutionaries and later communists and, in the last century, left libertarians and anarchists have interpreted Le Boissy as a founding voice for modern anarchist critiques of political subjection writ large. Baudin, on the other hand, lived into his 70s, just, and published an extensive oeuvre with works in the theory of history, economics, demonology, and of course his most famous Six Books of the Republic, analyzing in depth the theoretical foundations of law and the state. His articulation of the concept of sovereignty as the generative force for law, qua law, was germinative in modern social contract theories from Hobbes to Rousseau, and is credited by both its proponents and critics as central to the rise of the hegemonic modern political form and system of sovereign states. Baudin's identification of sovereignty as both the absolute and perpetual power of a regime and its laws, as well as his analogical reasoning that posits human sovereignty as the temporal cognate to divine sovereignty, was famously taken up by thinkers like Schmidt as the conceptual historical foundation for Schmidt's modern decisionist, that is to say, dictatorial or even fascist political theory. Yet, when read in tandem, and with attention to specific questions about the anthropological, social, and historical foundations of law and political life, the purportedly absolutist Baudin and the proto or crypto anarchist Le Boissy prove surprisingly closer to each other in some aspects. Or, put another way, they disagree in more subtle and unexpected, not to mention interesting ways than we might think, having encountered them separately and in the context of their distinct historical receptions and theoretical influence. As a means of demonstrating the fruitful outcome of reading the Boissy in tandem with Baudin, I will focus on what each, other, each author has to say about human nature and how that connects to their disagreement on the social relations and unity required to maintain a functioning legal polity. Comparing the two thinkers, on this fundamental question of human nature sheds light on why it is that they took opposing positions with regards to the question of toleration that was to become ever more exigent as successive wars of religion erupted in France in the second half of the 16th century. More specifically, examining the ways that the two thinkers agree and disagree on the fundamental question of human nature helps us to understand that Le Boissy's anti-tolerationist stance, expressed in his later Memoirs sur la pacification des troubles, represents less a rapprochement with Bodinian absolutist ideas of political sovereignty. As one might fairly wonder, reading Le Boissy's strong insistence on the need and even responsibility of the French crown to suppress minority worship and enforce universal membership in the official Gallic church but more rather a development of his political anthropology, which emphasizes humanity's fundamental dualism as innately free and equally innately pro-social beings. Baudin's rejection of state coercion in matters of doctrine and religious praxis and defense of toleration is in keeping with his political anthropology that emphasizes human individual freedom 
and free will with the deeper implications about moral agency and responsibility that it entails. So beginning with Lavoisier, quote, the nature of man is to be free and to wish to be so, but his nature also is such that he follows naturally the bent given him by his nurture, end quote. This is Le Boisie's dualist political anthropology most clearly articulated. It's from the discourse, which paints a picture of human nature as essentially defined by our desire for liberty, coupled with an innate pro-social amitié or general sociability that is a requirement of any common existence. Le Boisie's sketch of human nature as inherently opposed to any form of subju subjugation leads him to have to explain how it's come to pass that despite our apparent natural aversion towards servitude, so much of humanity finds itself living in servitude or under some form of tyranny. Le Boisy finds his answer in that other innate faculty humans possess, this amitié or sociability, which is both the reason we can live together in societies and why it is that custom, very broadly understood here, can have such a powerful role in shaping our lives even to the point of suppressing, at least for a time, and for very many, our innate thirst for freedom. Le Boisie's theory of human nature and how that nature relates to the development of various forms of political life is centered on the interplay between nature and nurture. Unlike Baudin, who's chiefly concerned with the free will that makes humans moral agents rightly subject to retributive justice, the Boise's political anthropology centers human drives toward both freedom and social harmony. The former spurs us toward liberty, while the latter drives us toward the social pursuit of both fairness, if not justice in the fullest political sense, as well as love and belonging that sees us adapting to the customs, mores, and even tyrannical social and political configurations of our families and communities of birth and upbringing. Our sociability makes us reasonably inclined to love virtue and have a natural sense of justice that seeks to reward and honor those whose perceived or demonstrated value and service to the community makes us think that they merit honor and advantage, even to our own diminishment. The young Le Boisie of the Discourse on Voluntary Servitude is adamant that we retain our natural freedom and love of freedom, even though our natural sociability may lead us to adapt to the social conditions of tyranny. Likely a little more than a decade after he wrote the discourse, Le Boisy found himself traveling through the troubled region of Agenais in the fall of 1561. Violence had broken out over the increasing minority reform communities. Royal edicts officially prohibiting public reform worship proved dead letters even as other public ordinances officially allowing reform use of Catholic spaces for wor of worship were being issued, decried, and then in turn implicated in Catholic reactionary violence. Etienne de la Boissy was intellectually and professionally well-placed to offer his own diagnosis of the violence and recommendations for how best to restore calm and order to the increasingly conflicted country. Though it remained unpublished for centuries, his short Memoir sur la pacification des troubles, or Memoir sur les dictes de janvier, is a fascinating document that presents public tolerationist policies such as Catherine de' Medici's January Edict, allowing for public reform worship, as not only unhelpful, but as exacerbating the existential political threat that minority worship posed to France. Presented as commentary on that royal edict, the memoir also outlines an alternative assimilationist approach to doctrinal diversity within the kingdom. Though his support for coercive intolerance is in many ways inconsistent with his earlier defense of individual freedom in the discourse on voluntary servitude, Le Boisy retains the same social lens of analysis with which he'd earlier analyzed tyranny and oppression. Moreover, his dualist understanding of human nature leads him to be particularly concerned about the socially constructed and reproduced nature of thought itself, particularly those beliefs about the form and legitimacy of public authority that he views as necessary for a polity to function. In Robert Sparling's reading of Le Boisie's Intolerance, the unsettling suggestion that Le Boisie puts forward of doctrinal coercion in the memoir, quote, is not a question of doctrinal content, but rather the maintenance of a common cultural practice that, 
like language, permits us to overcome the problem of not being able to see into one another's hearts. This strikes me as a deeply insightful reading of the voicee. The connection between doctrinal content and common cultural practice is rather at the heart of Lavoisier's social theory and anxieties about doctrinal diversity. Lavoisier is concerned precisely with maintaining a common community of transparency, transparency excuse me, that is, people who are deeply knowable to each other. The question of scrutability is also necessarily an epistemic question, but not merely with regard to what we can or cannot know about each other in a community but rather how our very horizons of thought are shaped by our social community. This raises the stakes of maintaining certain shared foundational assumptions about existence and being, ontological beliefs or the metaphysical assumptions decided by doctrine. Even beyond the maintenance of a kind of public friendship or republican amitié toward the breakdown of the possibility of truth itself, and the social and political breakdown that the Boise views as following inevitably in the wake of that. In the Discourse on Voluntary Servitude, the Boise describes the unfreedom of tyranny as a kind of social pathology where custom and greed obscure our innate, natural drive for freedom and, crucially, a sense of social connection within a common life world and corresponding obligation to a common good beyond individual self-interest. In order for individuals to live according to their own reason, free from political subjection, while also and necessarily living in social communities with others, they cannot each exist within their own individuated epistemic worlds. Given our innate sociability, it would be almost impossible for us to not adopt the prevailing consensus or custom, a disastrous turn of events should the pathological social formations of tyranny become normative custom of our community. The Boise's rejection of public toleration is in tension with his universalist and humanist ideals and arguments about natural freedom, and yet it also flows from his understanding of human nature and the social epistemic foundations of the universal political and legal order best suited to it. Reading Le Boise's statements strongly condemning seditious reform movements who reject the legitimate authority of what Le Boise repeatedly refers to as their natural sovereign or natural king, it's hard to maintain that the primary disagreement between Le Boisie and Baudet is over the legitimacy of political authority to cool, or theoretical existence of such a thing as a unified sovereign whose authority is both absolute and in some sense sanctioned within the natural order. Yet there are deep disagreements between the two thinkers, as exemplified in their opposite positions with regards to official toleration of minority religious factions within a sovereign polity. polity excuse me. When it comes to the question of toleration, the absolutist Baudin saw no need to outlaw minority worship, even assuming that Muslims and Jews would be tolerated as equally loyal subjects to the sovereign. This is in part because Baudin does not share Le Boisie's dualist view of human nature. Baudin characterizes humanity as fundamentally marked by our capacity for moral reasoning, predicated on the free will to choose between right and wrong, between good and evil, and then to rightly face the consequences of our chosen actions. Consequences not merely in this life, of course, but in the next one as well. Baudin's somewhat less famous work uh, on demonology, de la démonomanie des, excuse me, de la démonomanie des sorciers, is where Baudin provides the most explicit account concerned with matters of theology and human nature as it relates to both the divine order and human politics and law. From his discussions of witchcraft and the law in the Daemon of Mani, we can discern Baudin's method of comparative theology that he uses to synthesize his own theological framework. This is the basis of his account of human nature. Baudin provides a theology of the human condition and man's place within a divinely created rational order regulated by God's ordained natural laws and the very real facts of both benevolence and evil at work in the world, and, crucially, man's free will to choose between them. Baudin's theological anthropology anchors his corresponding political theology of sovereignty, with important implications for the kind of diversity that can be tolerated, if not expected, within a sovereign polity. 
The first book of the Daemonomanii opens with a seemingly straightforward definition of a witch. A witch, quote, a witch is he who knowingly uses diabolical means to try to achieve something, end quote. Baudin claims to have taken this definition from Roman civil law, though Baudin's formulation is evidently his own. The crucial, the crucial element of Baudin's definition of witchcraft is the question of knowledge and intention, which ultimately ties into Baudin's view of human nature. God created all creatures, including angels and demons. Angels and demons, though, are bound by their own nature as either simply good or simply malevolent. But malevolent excuse me. Baudin asserts that in order for there to be a relationship of any sort between beings, they must share some attribute. While there are some extraordinarily good and evil people in the extremes, most humans, quote, are neither good nor evil and can accommodate themselves to either one or the other, such that one could say that the intellectual soul of man is midway between the angels and the demons, end quote. For Baudin, the human condition is marked by this mixture of natural opposites. Quoting again, between all the brute beasts and intelligible nature of the angels and demons, God positioned man, a part of whom the body is mortal and a part of whom the intellect is immortal, end quote. Surprisingly absent from Baudin's account of human nature, particularly for contemporary readers of political theology, is the assumption of original sin. Indeed, the only mention of the sin of Adam is in relation to Cain's free choice to kill his brother Abel after the expulsion from Eden. For Baudin, the identification of humanity's nature with the ability to choose good or evil is necessary for both divine and human justice. This is why it's the crucial element of the definition of a witch he provides at the outset. Baudin's assertion that there are good and bad spirits who act in the world and can interact for better and worse with humans accords with a view of humans as essentially neither good nor evil. But it raises the complication of how we might determine when human actions are good or bad. Citing the Bible and Maimonides, Baudin argues that man's God-given free will is both that which essentially distinguishes him from the rest of creation and how we are to evaluate human actions. For Baudin, the moral of the story of Cain killing Abel is not that Cain carries the mark of his crime forever, but that we should be left in no doubt that the free will Adam and Eve exercised to sin in the Garden of Eden remains after the expulsion. Man's, quote, voluntary choice to be good or evil, not being born to evil after the fall, is constitutive of the human condition and the legitimation of both divine and temporal justice. Man is placed in control of his own actions and thus is culpable for his own crimes. Quoting again, this is why we use the word knowingly in the definition of which, end quote. Precisely because man can know and can intentionally, intentionally choose not only their actions, but their proper orientation toward the natural, that is divinely created order, we can and must hold him responsible for his attempts to circumvent that order. The justness of justice, human and divine, hinges on the franc arbitre, that free will and reason that Baudin puts forward as constitutive of the human condition. Missing from Baudin's account of human nature is the hypersociability that we find in Le Boissy's humanity. This is not to say that Baudin is particularly misanthropic or antisocial, but rather that when he imagines that which constitutes humans as humans, um, for him, it's our unique status as moral agents, capable of and indeed required to individually choose our faith and actions that we may rightly assume both the eternal rewards and punishments that our choices merit. Baudin does think that local custom and mores are important, particularly for the evolution of civil law and local precedents. And in his method for the easy comprehension of history, he discusses what seems to be a nascent climate theory, musing about how different geographic and climatic conditions may shape human cultures and, ever central to his investigations, the kinds of laws governing polities around the world. Yet, underneath it all, humans are everywhere, if they're human, <laughs> potentially subject to divine judgment 
and constituted by their individual capacity to reason about right and wrong action and then choose their actions accordingly. Indeed, the possibility of humans doing pretty much anything they can think of really produces a dazzling diversity of human ways of life and human nations, according to Baudin, even as we still share that basic free will constitutive of the human condition and our place within the divine order. A divine order which is itself constituted by the pleasant combat of countless opposing forces that ultimately produce the cacophonous harmony of the cosmos. Reading Baudin or Le Boissy on the question of human nature throws into relief what might otherwise appear a similar assumption of natural human freedom and their differing understanding of that which constitutes the human condition, which can help us better understand how both of them came to take positions on toleration that might otherwise be unexpected in light of their respective reputations as the, you know, the proto-anarchist or the absolutist not to mention statements about their, their statements about political authority and the nature of legitimacy of human subjection to a sovereign.